after lunch, but some of them have to be taken care of before lunch. So if there's any of your friends or conference members who are not here, can you please just pass the information on to them as well? So for those individuals who've been collecting CEs or the meeting center and meeting facilitator credits, you can turn those in at the back desk, at the continuing education desk, before the end of the night. For lunch today, there will be lunch at the atrium like we had yesterday, but today we're doing things a little bit different. We're going to have you sign up at the very back as well by the registration desk um, for the lunch today. So if you are attending the buffet, you can sign up with Nina. She'll be sitting in the back. And to go off the lunch thing as well, for tonight, we have I a celebration banquet. Last night, a few people were requesting vegetarian dishes. So tonight, we're making a list of all those members who need to or who would like to have vegetarian for tonight. You're going to be signing up with Nina as well. That will be listed in the back. For presentations today, any of our speakers who are here, if you have any flash drives or anything you need set up for presentations, Dan and Ming um, will be our two AV guys. They will have you guys set up. Please go to them. Um, they, will, they usually have been going up to some of the speakers and finding them, but just in case, they'll also be located usually in the back by the registration desk for any sign-up problems. Okay? And the last thing would be our membership meeting, which is going to be today at lunch in the Toronto D Ballroom. Um, all members of the IMPM organization should meet there. And probably actually one more thing, our last thing I think I mentioned earlier was our event evaluations. For those who have collected those have been doing them, those can also be dropped off at the back desk, the continuing education desk along with the CEs. Enjoy the rest of your conference everybody and we'll see you all soon. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see so many people for Sunday morning. It is my privilege this morning to introduce uh, this morning's keynote speaker, a longtime friend, member, and benefactor to IMPM, Dr. Sal Maddy. Dr. Maddy has a distinguished 52 career, 52 year career as a teacher author, theorist, researcher, and practitioner, and professor at the University of California, Irvine. With his, col with his colleague, Deborah Koshaba, Dr. Nagy pioneered research in hardiness, a way to navigate personal change and turn adversity to advantage. For his pioneering efforts, Sal is a co-recipient with Dr. Irvin Yellum, in, two, in the year 2000 and was awarded the INPM Lifetime Achievement Award. Next week in Orlando, Florida, Sal will be receiving the uh, Gold Medal Lifetime Achievement Award for Psychology in the Public Interest. Please join me in joining in welcoming Dr. Sal Maddy. title of the talk, okay? So let me go ahead. Hardiness is the pattern of attitudes and strategies that facilitates turning life's stressful circumstances from potential disasters into growth opportunities instead. Um, in this, the hardy attitudes are the so-called three C's of commitment, control, and challenge, which together 
provide the courage and motivation to do the hard work that is involved in, lear in, in learning from stresses and turning them to advantage. Specifically, commitment is the attitude that no matter how bad things get, it is best to stay involved with the people and situations rather than back off into isolation and alienation. Control is the attitude that no matter how bad things get, it is best to keep trying to have an effect on outcomes rather than sinking into powerlessness. And challenge is the attitude that life is by its nature stressful and that these stresses provide an opportunity to learn and grow by what one does. The hardy strategies that are facilitated by these hardy attitudes are problem solving rather than avoidance coping, socially supportive rather than conflictful social interactions, and beneficial rather than overly indulgent self-care. Okay? Problem solving, coping, socially supportive interactions, beneficial self-care. Those are the three party strategies that, um, uh, that you, you get the courage and motivation to do that through the party attitudes. Um, it is by persisting with these hardy attitudes and strategies that one is able to identify stresses clearly, analyze them accurately, learn from what is going on, and do what needs to be done, all the while growing in the process. Okay? This ongoing hardiness process is not just maintaining what you are doing, but actually enhancing one's functioning through the growth and wisdom and strength that takes place through turning stresses to advantage. This hardiness process is essentially important as indeed life is by its nature stressful. After all, throughout our lives there are ongoing developmental stresses roughly delineated by the aging process. These stressful stages start with the birth trauma and continue as we age. Before we know it, we are leaving our safe home to go to school, having to decide what kind of career and love relationships are right for us, how to help our own children go through their, through their stressful stages, and then dealing with the illnesses and deaths of those around us and ourselves. And as if these developmental stresses were not enough, there are mega trends which none of us can control that may be imposed on us at any time. Uh, examples that we're all experiencing these days are breathtakingly fast technological development, exemplified by the internet, globalization, racial and gender equality, and dramatic economic downturns. All in all, hardiness has never been more important than now. Now let me say, uh, just do a quick summary of some of the, uh, the major hardiness research that's relevant. The main purpose of my talk today is to inform you of recent research findings showing how hardiness may protect us against the denial and avoidance of stressful circumstances through such defensive activities as internet addiction, excessive consumer spending, and gambling. But before doing this, it will be helpful to you if I briefly summarize the pattern of hardiness research over the last 35 to 40 years. Um, first, the discovery of hardiness. How did I get into studying hardiness? Actually, in the 1960s and early 1970s, during my time at the University of Chicago, 
My main research activity was attempting to determine the personality factors influencing creativity. That work was showing that people who have what I call a need for variety are more likely to perform creatively. This is not surprising, as consistent creativity involves looking toward possibilities rather than present actualities. One day, a student in one of my classes brought me an article she had found uh, in Family Circle magazine that emphasized the message of the 1960s and 1970s. It said that we should all stay away from stressful circumstances because they can kill us. If that message was true, then what I was finding in our ongoing research is that creative people are trying to commit suicide. <laughs> this did not make any sense to me. We talked about it in our research meetings and came up with the thought that there may be individual differences in personality factors that determine whether the effects of stressors are negative or positive on us. Specifically, we thought that there may be personality factors that help you to not be undermined by stresses, but rather turn them to advantage by resolving them effectively and growing in the process. In order to test this, we needed to be able to follow people who were going through many stresses and determine what their personalities are like and how this influences their interaction with the stresses and their ongoing performance and health. At the time, I was a consultant for Illinois Bell Telephone, a subsidiary of AT&T headquartered in Chicago. For years, the telephone industry had been a federally regulated monopoly in order to ensure cheap and effective service for the public. But this was bound to end as our government was becoming preoccupied with the importance of encountering and encouraging lots of relevant companies in our country that would compete effectively and hence lead to the rapid development of the newly emerging communications and internet industry. I talked about this with Carl Horn, who was executive vice president at Illinois Bell and a friend of mine. And he concerned, he confirmed that at some, appro uh, at some approaching time, the monopoly status of Illinois Bell would end and the company would have to become competitive with all the stresses that would entail. I thought it was the best time to do a longitudinal research study to determine what effects the increases in stress due to the up upcoming deregulation would have on various personality types among the ongoing personnel of the company. Horn agreed and that is how the study from which hardiness emerged began. We followed 450 male and female supervisors, managers, and executives at Illinois Bell by testing them every year from 1975 through 1986. Each testing included interviews and a battery of relevant tests. Also included were the job performance and physical health evaluations obtained each year by the company and shared with our research team. The deregulation of the communications industry happened in 1981. The resulting dis uh, disruptive stresses are still regarded as one of the major upheavals in business industry. Between 1981 and 1982, the inevitable downsizing in Illinois Bell led to nearly half of its employees losing their jobs. In 1982, one of the managers in our sample put the problem very well when we asked him what the deregulation was, was like. He said, quote, I have had 10 different supervisors in 12 months. They are in and out the door and don't know what is going on. Nor do I know what 
what is going on. End quote. As to our study, in the six years following deregulation upheaval, nearly two-thirds of the managers of our sample showed one or more signs of breakdown in performance and health. There were heart attacks, strokes, cancer, anger management problems at home or at work, suicides, depression disorders, anxiety disorders, and divorces. In contrast, the other third of the sample not only survived well, but actually thrived. If they stayed at Illinois Bell, they rose up in the ranks through their ability to handle the stresses and grow in that process. If they were downsized out of the company, they found management roles in other companies that were forming due to the enhanced competition produced by the deregulation. Or they started companies of their own on the grounds of the years of experience and communications functions they had gained at Illinois Bell. <clears throat> to determine what had led to two-thirds of the managers being undermined by the re regulation upheaval, deregulation upheaval, <coughs> all the while the other third not only survived, but also thrived. We compared these two groups on the psychological, medical, and work data we had collected prior to 1981. <clears throat> and that was how we discovered hardiness. Um, let's see, figure one shows that. Um, to determine what had led to two-thirds of the managers being undermined by, um, oh yeah, I said that already. Figure one shows the bad news in the sinister line from left to right. In short, stressful circumstances involve events that can be either acute, uh, that is like unpredictable, or chronic, that is continuous. Um, an unpredictable stress could be having an automobile accident when you get in the car next to you infected. Or a chronic uh, stress could be thinking of yourself as a loving person and not being able, not being able to find somebody who would lavish that on. Okay, so uh, stresses can be either acute or chronic, and both of these combine to produce the level of stress the person is experiencing at any, any given time. This level of stress leads to bodily arousal called strain, which involves the so-called fight or flight syndrome, which involves extensive endocrine and immune system responses. If this arousal syndrome is too intense and too prolonged, then the person's risk of wellness breakdown increases. There's a lot of research that shows that. Signs of wellness breakdown can be physical. Examples are heart rates, heart attacks, or strokes. It could be mental, depression, anxiety, anger attacks, uh, and or behavioral, such as inability to concentrate, forgetfulness, and self-preoccupation that can lead to poor work performance and deteriorated relationships. Now, the two-thirds of our sample that fell apart after the deregulation had all along, that is, before as well as after the deregulation, shown high levels of arousal and some performance and health problems. In contrast, the one-third of the sample that grew and developed after the deregulation had all along shown lower arousal, performance, and health problems. Also, this one-third of the managers in our sample had all along shown the pattern of beliefs and strategies that we ended up calling hardiness whereas this pattern was less present in the vulnerable two-thirds of the sample. In particular, the less vulnerable third of the sample were much stronger all along in those hardy attitudes of commitment, control, and challenge, and those hardy strategies 
of problem-solving coping, socially supportive interaction with others, and effective self-care. This pattern of hardy attitudes and strategies was particularly effective in resolving the stressful circumstances by turning them to advantage, which reduced their negative effects on arousal and subsequent performance and health breakdowns. You can see all of that on the slide. As a matter of fact, as you can see in, on the slide, the arrows connecting the hardy attitudes and strategies to each other go in both directions. What about that? This means that not only does the courage of the hardy attitudes motivate one to do the hard work involved in the hardy strategies, but also that effectively expressing these strategies can lead to um, deepening these attitudes by what you learn. This latter point is important in the hardiness training program that Deborah Koshaba and I have developed, which involves trainees in expressing the hardy attitude, so hardy strategies, under the encouragement and support of a hardy trainer. And then, using the positive results of this to deepen the, the trainee's hardy attitudes. When that happens, the hardy trainer is no longer needed by the trainee in his or her efforts in transforming stressful circumstances to advantage. The Hardy Training Program was originally developed for Illinois Bell several years after the deregulation and has grown ever since. There are now research results showing that Hardy Training improves performance and health um, in working adults and in college students. I won't go into it, there's a lot of research there. Now, uh, further hardiness research since the Illinois Bell study, we'll take a few seconds to go over that. Since the Illinois Bell work, there's been lots of hardiness research in the United States and around the world. The results are quite consistent with the hardiness model shown on this figure one. In particular, the hardy attitudes show consistent positive relationships with the hardy strategies. There is also a consistent positive relationship between the hardy attitudes and the various measures of performance and health um, in samples not only of college students, but also of working adults, adults working in businesses, in nursing, athletics, the military, firefighting, and policing organizations. In this, the hardy strategies play a moderating role. Thus, the hardy attitudes play a more important role in facilitating performance and health than does optimism, religiosity, or simple happiness. There's research on that too. All this fits well without theorizing about hardiness as you can see. I won't go into all of those studies. Um, hopefully many of you know it already. Now how about the current status of hardy, hardiness assessment and training? Let me spend a little time on that. By now we have developed a comprehensive measure called the Hardy Survey 3R, um, which is a 65 item questionnaire that can be taken on our website. We have the address in, that was on slide one, and automatically provides a comprehensive report. This test assesses not only hardy attitudes, but also hardy, uh, that is problem solving, coping, hardy, that is supportive social interactions, and hardy, that is beneficial self-care. It also assesses one's stress and strain, and the comprehensive report puts this all together estimating one's strengths and vulnerabilities regarding performance and health. There is also a comprehensive hardy training program, which I've already mentioned. This program involves individuals or small groups of trainees working together with a certified hardiness trainer. If the training involves all the components of hardiness, it takes about 12 once a week sessions. Um, which emphasize concepts and exercises in our hardiness training workbook. 
and relevant discussions of trainee efforts that take place in between sessions. We also have a train the trainer program that can be taken by professionals who want to become certified hardness trainers. The first step in this train the trainer program is an, is an intensive three-day session followed by our supervision of the train, trainer's ongoing training efforts. The supervision usually lasts about six months. Okay. Now, um, I'm, I'm going to bring you up to date on research uh, findings that we're getting just now. They're not published yet. Okay? Um, and I mentioned that at the beginning of the talk. After all this summary, let me turn to research we now have underway on the role of hardiness in avoiding strategies of dealing with stressful circumstances with denial and avoidance. Our conceptualization, as indicated earlier, is that the attempt to avoid and deny rather than deal with stressful circumstances is deleterious in the long run. This is because denial and avoidance do not really resolve the stressful circumstances. So they are still there and able to keep bodily arousal high enough to produce performance and health deterioration over time. Consequently, a common expression of denial and avoidance of ongoing stressful circumstances is immersing yourself in other distracting, um, uh, though, uh, though addictive behaviors, such as excessive spending, gambling, and internet use. <coughs> Our current research deals with a particular application of this, namely that is, there is a negative relationship between hardiness and internet addiction, excessive com com consumer spending, and gambling. These days, the internet is so pervasive that we are all more or less involved in it. But some people end up using the internet as a way of avoiding the complexities and difficulties involved in the day-to-day -day interactions with actual people and circumstances. Further, excessive consumer spending is probably another way of distracting oneself from one's ongoing stressful circumstances. <coughs> Similarly, gambling is probably yet another way one can distract oneself from the stressful circumstances of one's living. In all this, we would expect that hardiness is a personality protection against the denial and avoidance involved in internet addiction, excessive spending, and gambling. Our sample for this study involved 368 undergraduates at the University of California, Irvine. These students received extra course credit for participating. The sample was similar to the overall student population at that university in gender, age, and family income. The best and latest measure of hardiness used in this study was the personal use Personal Views Survey 3R, or PVS 3R, which has shown adequate reliability and considerable validity. This test includes 18 items. As to com commitment, a positively worded sample item is, quotes, most days, life is really interesting and exciting for me, end quote. And a negatively worded item is, quote, it's hard to imagine anyone getting excited about working, end quote. For control, a positively worded sample item is, quote, what happens to me tomorrow depends on what I do today, end quote. And a negatively worded item is, quote, no matter how hard I try, my efforts usually accomplish nothing. They usually accomplish little ones, sorry, end quote. And to challenge, a positively worded item is, quote, changes in routine provoke me to learn, end quote. And a negatively, negatively worded item is, quote, it bothers me when my family, my, it bothers me when my daily routine gets interrupted, end quote. 
Estimates of internal consistency reliability have been added, averaging 0.69, 0.57 and 0.69 for commitment control and challenge, respectively, and 0.73 for total hardiness. Um, now, maybe we should go on to the next slide. The measure of internet addiction used was the problematic Internet Usage Survey, which involves 15 Likert items. Sample items include, quote, do you neglect household chores to spend more time on social networking sites, end quote. Quote, does your schoolwork suffer because of the amount of time you spend on social networking sites, end quote. End quote, do you lose sleep due to late night logins, end quote. Also included was a measure of money conservation and two measures of excessive consumer spending. The money conservation measure involved the three items of the fifth factor of the money ethics scale, which has shown adequate reliability. These items were, quote, I use my money very carefully, end quote. Quote, I budget my money very well, end quote. And quote, I pay my bills immediately in order to avoid interest or penalties, end quote. The other seven items are those included in the fourth factor of the money attitude scale, which has also shown adequate reliability. Examples of these items are, quote, I prefer to use money rather than credit cards, end quote. Quote, I always know how much money I have in my savings and or checking accounts, end quote. And quote, I am proud of my ability to save money, end quote. Now one of the measures of uh, excessive consumer spending was the, the uh, Edwards Compulsive Buying Scale. It includes 13 items, samples of which are, quote, I feel driven to shop and spend, even though when I don't, even when I don't have the time or the money, end quote. And quote, I buy things even when I don't need anything, end quote. And quote, I go on a buying binge when I'm upset, disappointed, depressed, or angry, end quote. This scale has adequate reliability and is consistent with the data from intensive interviews on compulsive buying. <clears throat> Another measure of excessive consumer spending, this is by Ridgeway and his colleagues, was also included. <clears throat> the six, this six-item test was carefully developed and shows adequate reliability. It has also been validated by demonstration that the scale score shows a positive relationship with actual purchasing patterns on the internet. Examples of these test items are, quote, much of my life centers around buying things, end quote. End quote, I buy things I don't need, end quote. <clears throat> Now, a measure, finally, a measure of gambling was also used in this study. It is the Canadian Problem Gambling Assessment, which includes 12 Likert items which con concern excessive involvement in and preoccupation with gambling. Examples of these items are, quote, have you bet more than you could really afford to lose, end quote. And, quote, have you borrowed money or sold anything to get money to gamble? End quote. This test has shown, ad shown adequate reliability and has been validated through uh, internet interviews with gamblers. I'm sorry, intensive interviews with gamblers, not internet. Now, table one here shows the correlation findings we obtained in this study. As expected, the correlations are all negative and statistically significant. This indicates that the higher your hardiness, the less likely you will be to become addicted to internet use, to gambling, or to excessive consumer spending. <clears throat> Consistent with this is the positive relationship between hardiness and money con conservation. 
These findings add to what we already know about hardiness by indicating that it does indeed decrease the tendency to deny and avoid stressful circumstances. Um, uh, that's it for now. Uh, we, have, we certainly have time for questions, if you want to raise questions. Anybody have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to see the lights are in my eyes here. Go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, the Illinois Bell study showed that about one third of the uh, participants in the study proved to be hard, and about two thirds not. And I wonder if that percentage has been sustained over the course of the research, number one. Say that again, the last sentence. Here's the name. Here it comes. And I'll say it all again. The original Illinois Bell study indicated that about two thirds of your respondents proved not to be too hardy, and one third quite hardy and landed on their feet from the derail. And my question, part of my question is, has that percentage been sustained over the course of subsequent hardiness research? That's part one. And part two, what helps us determine who's going to be hardy and who's not? Are, is this heritable traits? Does this, what does this have to do? Is it correlated to educational level, family structure, gender? How do we, how do we know who's going to be hardy? It make it into the one third if the percentages have been sustained. Uh, first of all, recognize that the two thirds, one third, that had to do with, that was determined by those who survived and thrived, as opposed to those who fell apart after the deregulation. But generally speaking, if, uh, if you look at the whole pattern of percentile ratings of hardiness um, that we've, we've obtained over 35, 40 years now, um, you, know, you, you find that um, most, most people are lower in hardiness, most people. Um, is, is it that the ones who are higher, is, is it one third? Well, it depends how you want to look at it, okay? But there's a, certainly a big range, okay? Now, to the second part of your question, how does hardiness develop? Um, who knows whether there's some um, uh, innate, tendency toward hardiness. It's hard to know. But we do know that hardiness can be trained. We, we can increase people's hardiness by the hardiness training that we've developed. And um, the, the, the elements of the hardiness training, if you look back to people's history, we, at Illinois Bell Telephone, we were able to interview people about their, their uh, growing up history and stuff like that. And we also do that with, <clears throat> uh, with adults now, where we have a lot more, there was more detail in the Illinois Bell sample. It's, it's pretty clear that um, <clears throat> what we do, what we call hardness training now, is the kind of interaction a kid needs with their parents in order to emerge as, as uh, high in hardiness. Um, Dr. Kershava's uh, dissertation. PhD dissertation, which was done on the Illinois Bell sample, showed that the one third that survived and thrived and were high in hardiness, uh, their, uh, the way they described their interaction with, uh, in their early life with their parents and family, is that there was lots of stresses, but their parents encouraged them to recognize that they could figure out how to handle the stresses and would support them every time they came up with a way to handle the stresses. Um, examples were, uh, um, uh, you know, somebody who uh, had moved around from place to place while he was very young because his, his father was in the military. Um, but his, his parents had encouraged him to believe that he could handle all the stresses that were happening that he could really do. 
I remember when I was a kid, um, growing up, um, uh, you know, my parents were um, uh, illiterate immigrants to uh, New York City from Sicily, um, and we never, we, it was during the, 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 the a big depression, and we, we had no money. And I remember one time walking along the street, in, you know, uh, my mother holding my hand, and I, I was crying. And she said, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And uh, she hugged me, uh, and, and she said, courage. Have courage. Don't worry. It, it'll work out. And you're the hope of the family. You're the hope of the family. So they made sure I went, I went to, I went to college and graduate school and everything like that, okay? So we know that um, that is very similar to the kind of thing that happens during our hardiness training procedure. Does that mean that it only works if you have some innate characteristics? Who knows? That issue can never be resolved. Have you done any controls for gender on this? Have you done any controls for gender on this? For gender? Uh, we have shown that um, at, uh, with uh, University of California, Irvine, college students, there are no gender differences. Uh, is that, but that's not enough to be sure to reach a conclusion for every, for every kind of sample. And indeed, most of the undergraduates at the University of California, Irvine, are female. But there's no difference between males and females. That's, that's the only study that's reported. That. Other studies haven't really done it yet. That could be good to do. Um, yes. Go ahead. Oh, until she gives you a First of all, congratulations on a great body of research over the years. Congratulations on a great body of research over the years. I've always been fascinated a little bit about your hardiness training. I'm just curious about some of the exercises or interventions. If you could give us a flavor of what that looks like to help people develop hardiness. Um, I can give you a little flavor of it. I, I thought you probably all knew about it because I talked about that in other meetings, IAPM meetings. Uh, but, you know, there's probably new people here. In fact, we were good. Uh, Dr. Kershaba and I were going to do a workshop. Um, on part of this training, but it had to be canceled because uh, we're having some uh, some troubles. Uh, uh, one of my sisters is very ill, and we're trying to deal with that, so we canceled the workshop. And I just got here last night. But in any event, um, to try to answer your question, um, in you know, let's say it's a small group of people that we're training. It could be done with one person too, but it actually works better with a small group. Uh, and they meet once a week for, uh, if the group shouldn't be more than about um, uh, 12 to 15 people. It's once a week for an hour or an hour and a half. And um, the first step is for people to um, make a list of all of the stressful circumstances they're experiencing right now in their life that they haven't resolved yet. Okay. Um, and they share this with each other in the, in the first session. Um, and that's important as a learning experience. I remember, for example, the Illinois Bell Telephone, when we did this, we had a group of managers. We got around to one of the managers in the group and asked him um, about his stresses. And he said, I don't think I have any stresses. So I, I, I uh, winced and I said to him, well, why are you here? It's voluntary. <laughs> you, you, you don't have to come in. And he said, well, my wife thinks I have stresses because I have trouble sleeping. I said, oh, okay, we'll sit here and we'll see how it goes. And then as we went further around the room, people brought up their stresses. He would speak up and say, I have that too. I have that too. So he was learning about his stresses. This is someone whose job at Illinois Bell Telephone was to be a stress manager. He was in denial and avoidance. Okay? So the, the first step is for people to recognize their stressful circumstances rather than deny and avoid them. 
have, then they, what they do is they, they pick one stressful circumstance at a time. It's up to them which one they dis decide to pick. Uh, they could pick up one of the small stresses so they can learn about the procedure easier. Or they, if, if they're so overwhelmed by one of the stresses that you can't think about anything else, they can pick that one. Okay? Um, and they start working on the stress with our techniques for um, problem-solving coping. Those, those techniques involve first um, asking yourself how the stress could become even worse than it is and the likelihood that that will happen. Then, then you ask yourself, how could the stress be better than, than it actually is? And what's the likelihood of that happening? And then you ask yourself, what could I do that could stop the worst possibility from taking place and help the better possibility from happen, to happen? And you make up a story. Okay. But once you've made up that story, <laughs> then you're, uh, you, you try to put it into action. Uh, you make a list of the steps that you have to take okay. that will lead you to the, to the goal of improving the stress and circumstances. Uh, you, put, you make the list in the order in which they have to be taken, and you ask yourself how long each step will take. And then once you've done that, you start taking the steps, and you see what the feedback is, and you use the feedback to either go on to the next step if the first step was successful, or change that first step and try it again, and then go on to the second step, etc., etc. So that's the problem-solving coping approach. As far as socially supportive interactions are concerned, you make a list of the relationships you have, the significant relationships you have in your life, with presumably family members, maybe certain work colleagues, whatever it may be, friends. And then you, we have a scale that helps you to evaluate how conflictful each of those stressful circumstances may be. If, the, if, if a set of stressful, if an interaction is not conflictful, you don't have to work on it. But if it is conflictful, then the next step is to try to resolve the conflict. And the way to do that is by being more open and complete in your communication with the other person and to listen more effectively to what the other person is saying so you don't just hear a particular word that you don't like and then jump on them. Okay? And I can't go into all of the details of those uh, techniques, but they're very well worked out. And then finally, with regard to effective self-care, you know, we help the, uh, the trainees to understand that stressful circumstances increase your wish for sweet and fatty foods. And we help them to understand what the effect of excessive eating of sweet and fatty foods will be um, on, your, on your life right now and on your life in the future. And so we, we, we encourage them to um, change their eating habits, even though they're still trying to work on the stresses and haven't resolved them all. We encourage them to change their eating habits so that they don't eat excessively sweet and fatty foods. Okay. And basically, we go there with the, uh, uh, there's a diet, I can't remember the particular name, but it's it balanced. It's like three, um, you know, three reasonably small meals a day with um, uh, three snacks, so a snack in between each meal, and then the, the, the final snack is right before you go to sleep. Oh, yeah. But even the snacks have to be balanced. Okay. We have a question here. I'm sorry. Okay, that's, that's basically my answer to your question. Yes, um, another question. First of all, thank you for sharing the historical development of your, thank you for sharing the historical development of your research, it's very interesting. And I'm wondering, um, were you able to cycle back to the creativity Say issue? Say that again. Were you able to cycle back to the creativity issue that first uh, got you started along this path, and, and indeed, were those creative people more hardy as you uh, intuited at that point? Um, yes, we, we have uh, several studies that show that the higher your hardiness, 
the greater the likelihood that you will be creative in whatever it is you're working on. Um, um, we, um, uh, you know, there's a, it, it's not just performance, it's actually performing creatively. We've shown that um, there, are, um, there are several studies, and they, I can't think of them all right now. Um, so basically now, I'm not emphasizing need for variety anymore as I was all the way back then, 50 years ago, um, but rather hardiness attitudes. Now hardiness attitudes basically include need for variety because if you think of challenge, the hardiness attitude of challenge, it, it, you say to yourself, life is by its nature stressful. I'm not unusual that I'm experiencing stresses. Life is by its nature stressful, and that's a, a wonderful opportunity to grow and develop by what you can learn by trying to deal effectively with the stresses. Now, dealing effectively with the stresses is not denying and avoiding, not making believe they're not there, but rather resolving them by the problem-solving coping, the socially um, supportive interactions, and the beneficial self-care. Uh, all of which have elements of creativity in them, but it, it, several studies have been done that actually use particular measures of creativity, like um, one of the studies we did used the unusual uses test as a measure of creativity. You give the subject, uh, you ask the subject to come up with, <clears throat> uh, well, you, you give the subject four um, common things, like a paper clip, would be an example. Paper clip. You ask the subject to come up with, of each of these common characteristic uh, things, you ask the subject to come up with four possible uses of the uh, paper clip. Uh, the obvious use is to hold papers together, right? But um, uh, if you come up with four, you get more closer and closer to, to being creative. A creative use of the paper clip, uh, for example, would be to straighten it out and pinch the other person with it. Okay? Uh, as a way of getting back at them or something. Um, uh, so basically, what we do is the more unusual your uses are of, of these four uh, uses of each object. By comparison with the rest of the sample, the higher your creativity level. That's a common measure of creativity. And we've shown that that shows a positive correlation with hardiness measured before the creativity test was used, the unusual uses test was used, was employed. <coughs> yes. So why did you say today that hardiness is an academically illegal model of dealing with courage to be? Like an academically yeah. what? That hardiness is the academically legal model of the courage to be, dealing courage to be. Academically legal? Yes, you, you did say some time ago, it's quite forever to hear for this conference, for this audience, dealing with all dealing courage to be. Courage to be. Yes, you did say some time ago. Well, I just didn't want to go into all of the details. See, you know it already, for example, Dimitri. So why, why go over it again? <laughs> um, so, but basically what you're getting at is um, uh, one of the ways that was influential to me in coming up with this idea, aside from the data I knew my Bell Telephone, was um, um, when I was a, a graduate student at Harvard, Gordon Oldport was giving us a a, um, uh, a seminar, and one day um, well, he assigned to us to read um, Paul Tillich's The Courage to Be. Paul Tillich is not a psychologist, I mean, but he wrote this, he was a, uh, a uh, um, uh, physician, I'm sorry, a, a minister, and he, um, the, that book influenced me quite a bit in the sense that what he was saying, even though he was a minister, he was saying about the courage to be, what that means is you can't just hide behind God. You can't just, God makes all the decisions, I just have to fit in, and I'll do whatever he or she wants. 
uh, but, but rather, you have to look at your life and try to deal with it courageously. Now, he didn't go too much further than that, but if you look at hardiness, it's basically a kind of objectification of what people like Paul Tillich were talking about in the courage to be. Just a quick question. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Just That's a good good. question. Thank you. Um, would you consider your hardiness um, equivalent to resiliency? In the hardiness what? Would you consider um, your definition of hardiness to be an equivalent to uh, the resiliency that Mimi Center Therapy speaks of? Uh, I don't see it as, quote, well, it depends on you know, one's definition of resilience. See, um, resilience, as far as hardiness people are concerned, is not merely um, persisting despite the stresses, but rather, in addition to persisting, growing and developing through handling the stresses effectively. So if you mean by resilience, growing and developing under stresses, then it's very similar to hardiness. Most people who use the concept of resilience, however, just mean continuing to function the way you're functioning despite stressful circumstances. And that's not hardiness. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, why don't you wait until you get there? Um, Thank you very much. Um, a very simple question. Where does meaning making come into all of this? Since this is what the conference is about. Yes. Well, um, the, the, the process of hardy attitudes leading to hardy strategies is clearly meaning making. Because through the hardy strategies, you grow and develop by, by what you've learned in resolving the stress. That's meaningful. You, uh, you, um, you grow and develop by resolving the stresses and significant, the uh, conflicts and significant relationships so that they get deeper, more intimate. That's meaningful. And you, uh, you, know, you keep your health going fine by, you know, by uh, decreasing the likelihood by, uh, of how you um, of your vulner vulnerability to, to poor self-care, okay? Now, um, that's meaning-making as far as hardiness is concerned. Now, the contrast is, that needs to be taken into account is that if you simply impose on whatever is happening in you in life, things you already know, goals you already have, values you already have, just keep imposing over and over and over again. Um, that's not what we would call meaning making. That is meaning. The, the alternative could be you could give up on everything and have no meaning in your life. But it isn't enough to just continue to impose what you already know. What's really important for hardiness is to continue to grow and develop and know more and more, and become more and more, a, 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 you know, an, an ideal person, a, a, an individualistic person, through your experiences. Okay. So, so hardiness certainly is meaning making, but it's not just meaning making that involves imposing what you already know on whatever happens. Hope that helps. I, I, don't, I don't have anything to wrap up with. <laughs> I'm already wrapped up. <laughs>